when he comes in, uh, uh, there he is, we'll all give him a round of applause and, and hope he doesn't make a speech. Uh, I have prepared them uh, for the fact that you can't be here but a few minutes. And, uh, but he certainly uh, uh, really appreciates uh, all of you and, and counts uh, this county as a, as a great uh, asset in the war that he is waging uh, up in Washington for us. And I know you are, you are so proud of him as, well, as I am. And thank you for taking the time to uh, stop by here and just uh, say hi to us and and then you can move on to something else. So, <laughs> you know this guy better not better than you know me, Louis Gomer. Yo, uh, well, thank you, thanks, Bob. Well, it's a uh, it's it's a treat to be with you anytime. And and uh, I mean, y'all standing up for me, y'all. I'm the same guy that you were helping get elected, you know, eight years ago. Come on now. I mean, it, it's the same guy. Uh, it's just I, I keep fighting for what we said we were going to fight for when you, you helped me get elected the first time, and we're still fighting. So just a couple of things. Um, you, you know, I had heard back in the 90s Rush Limbaugh talk about you know, how stupid it was that we had automatic increases in our budget, every federal department, and that we need to cut that out. Well, back then I was a judge at Congress wasn't on my radar, and, uh, but when I got to Congress, it still hadn't been done. And in 05 and 06, we were in the majority, and we hadn't done anything about it. So I filed a bill, and I pushed it, and I brought it up at our retreat in January of 05 and, and 06, and our leadership in January of 06, it was Dennis Hastert, speaker, brand-new majority leader named John Boehner, and a budget committee chair named John, Jim Nuzzle, and they said, no, no, we, we, we're, that we have to follow. And Nuzzle said, look, we, can't, we have to do the automatic increase. And I said, why? And I'm at the member, Mike. He's up with Hastert and Boehner at the front. And he said, because it's the law. And see, like you, I, just, I was just dumbfounded. I didn't do anything. I just went. And he said, you're right, you're right, we make the law, you're right, you're right. I didn't even say it, I didn't have to. But he said, but, but we, we're just going to have to live with this for now. Well, it was stupid, we should have fixed it. So the next two years, the next term of Congress, I filed it again. Well, Pelosi didn't bring it to the floor. The next two years, I filed it again. Pelosi didn't bring it to the floor. And so this Congress, I filed it again, and it was pushing. And uh, uh, a year ago, I had gotten... Uh, Boehner to promise that if Paul Ryan brought it out of the budget committee, he would bring it to the floor for a vote. And I got Paul to promise me he would bring it out of committee. And so they voted it out of committee. And I told them both, look, I don't care whose name's on this bill, but it needs to be done. And they took me at my word, and they took my language that we had crafted over seven years' time, six years' time, and put it in a new bill and and put the name of a freshman who's a sharp freshman. And that really is a good idea. A freshman comes in, looks like he's been able to come up with this great legislation. And it is amazing what you can get done if you don't care who gets the credit. And I don't. And so a great young freshman on the budget committee, Rob Woodall, and he marshals it through committee with Paul's guidance. They bring it to the floor, we get it voted through. Now, I was telling Paul, we ought to, get, we ought to put pressure on the Senate to get it done this fall. And I said, it's a great election issue. Uh, say we got 47 Republicans in the Senate. There's 21 supposedly vulnerable. Tell them, look, you either support ending the automatic increase in every federal budget, or we're going to use that to hammer you over the head this fall. Well, uh, people didn't listen to me. Paul liked the idea, but he's taking orders from somebody else now. But he told me uh, two weeks ago, he says, Louie, if, if we... It doesn't look like they're going to make it a campaign issue, but I promise you, as president of the Senate, 
we're going to get it through the Senate too. So that's eight years, folks. Eight years. William Wilberforce, it took 20 years to stop you know, year after year fighting to end the slave trade and then 28 more years. Well, y'all, I'm not going to do this for 20 years. Yeah, I'm not going to do it for 48 years that it took him to end slavery. But, but I've seen, and God's grace has shown me, you just got to keep fussing about things to get things done. And so another thing, um, it, it, you know, just uh, y'all, I know, share my heart for, for Israel. We don't need to be betraying Israel as this administration has done repeatedly. Um, so just a real quick uh, aside. Uh, most of y'all know, you know, I'd, I'd been pushing for a year to get Netanyahu invited. Couldn't get Pelosi to do it. She said in June of 2010, look, it's a nice idea, but we just don't have time between now and the end of the year because we had a lot of courthouses we had to name and football and baseball teams. Those, those take an hour when you congratulate a baseball team or football team. You, you know, we hadn't done those yet, so... Just no way to get to uh, Netanyahu coming. So in May of 2011, I had redone the letter to a new speaker, Boehner, one of the few things he had done that I was really pushing for. And uh, in, in August of 2009, when I was in Israel, what I had said to Prime Minister Netanyahu in a conference room was, look, this has been on my heart. I want to make sure you know and that you know many of us in Congress know that going back to the very inception of Israel 3,000 years ago, there has never been a time when Israel has given away land that it has not ultimately been used as a staging area from which to attack it. And it got real people in there knew he was prime minister back in the 90s when they had given away some land, and it was a horrible mistake. So people were wondering. They told me, I was afraid you offended him. And... Uh, Anyway, he just deadpan. He's got a great poker face, and finally he said, "That's a problem, isn't it?" And we went, "Yeah, it's a big problem." So anyway, I did not know until July, and this is 14 months after we got him to come speak. I'm told 27 uh, standing ovations. Uh, it, it was the best speech I've heard since I've been in Congress. Um, well. A lady came by the office in July said she had a very dear friend who was in an inner circle of Netanyahu back at, at, at the time. And she said, I just thought you ought to know how you'd been used. Um, before Netanyahu left Israel, he'd gathered some really core, close confidants and said, you know, the whole world is against us. We've got no friends. And the U.S. administration is putting more and more pressure on us to, to do more to try to draw in the Palestinians. I don't know what else we can do. I think we're going to have to give away more land. So you guys be thinking about it while I go to the U.S. and we'll talk again when I get back. And so after that incredible reception he got in Congress from both sides of the aisle repeatedly standing it may have been 27 times. I didn't, I didn't count. But uh, she said when he got back to Israel, he said, after the reception I got in Congress, we're not giving away anything. She said, you never know how you'll be used. Well, I count on you to keep me uh, grounded to doing the things that we all believe in. And... Uh, if Mitt Romney gets elected, as we're hoping and praying and working for, well, keep in mind, it doesn't stop then. The good news is Mitt Romney is a people pleaser. The bad news is Mitt Romney is a people pleaser. <laughs> and so that means come January, everybody across the country is going to have to make sure that we let him know this is what America believes in, this is what you said you would do, and we expect you to do it. So we got a lot of work to do between now and November. He sure made it a lot easier with that debate performance, didn't he? <laughs> and, and Paul's going to do well this week. But let me just warn you in advance, though. H having been on Fox so many times, uh, my press person told me um, last month, she said, did you know you were on 
Fox 74 times last year. I'm like, wow. No, I had no idea. Uh, I, all I can figure is when I'm on, whoever I'm on with, Sean or, or um, Neil Cavuto, whoever, they look better. That's all. That, <laughs> that's got to be the only reason they keep having me back on there. I don't know. But... Um, but let me just, because I've debated with people, in, including Beckel, and in fact, at the convention, at the convention uh, uh, this summer, uh, I'd, I had an early morning Fox interview, and they said, hey, we've got this huge breakfast buffet, why don't you have breakfast? And, and Mike Huckabee walks up and says, hey, Louis, is, is that you? So we sat down, we are having breakfast. Beckel walks up and goes, well, I'll be. <laughs> Two conservatives I hate just about more than any other right here together. Isn't that special? But anyway, uh, uh, but he said something that I found encouraging, and he didn't mean it that way, but he said, you know, I've seen Republican conventions year after. Every four years we see them. We, I've been to some of the state conventions and seen them. And he said, what always encouraged me is the only people there had white hair, no hair, or blue hair. And he says, I look around at this convention and it scares me. You got a lot of young people here. He said, you guys have got a bench now. He said, that's, prob that's problematic. Uh, you've never had a bench before. You've got a bench. And we do. And young people are getting the message and they're our hope for the future. We just got to make sure we don't lose it before we get it to them. But I love you all. Thank you so much. I look around and see great elected officials and people that are so good uh, for all of us. That, and it, it, it's encouraging just to be here with you. But there's a fundraiser in my honor, and I really kind of need to get there. So thank you all very much for letting me stop by. Aren't you, aren't you glad? I don't know if that's working. Aren't you glad that Bob Beckel hates him? <laughs> hey, I'll see you later. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you being here. And by the way, on Beckel, he also told me later, he said, you know, I talk to Democrats all the time, and, I, you know, you're one of the craziest Republicans there is. And he said, they still seem to like you uh -oh. for some reason. <laughs> he said these Democrats are on the far opposite end, but for some reason, they say, I, he said, I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Congressman. Oh, uh, I noticed that uh, our, uh, well, one of them's leaving. He's going out to catch it.